Ladies and gentlemen, a warm Wednesday welcome to our Pangea 2022 Q2 Investment Manager Update with Mr. Matt Sparling, Director of FSI Investments. Matt has just returned from Mexico and a uh, brief stint through uh, Florida, so he's refreshed and ready for this call. I know he's looking forward to sharing an update with Pangea clients this evening. Um, Matt, I've chosen to entitle this call Recession Risk rising. In the context of the economy, two things are top of mind for most people. And uh, number one is rising interest rates. Uh, second, of course, is inflation. They're seeing it at the gas pumps and in their, their food bills. And a third concern is quickly rising, and that is of a recession. Now, a recession may be in the cards for Canada's economy, according to some prominent Bay Street economists. And Matt, you more than anyone else uh, probably know that old joke, an economist is an expert who will know tomorrow why the things he predicted yesterday didn't happen today. Now, while we joke about those uh, fun things and all these experts all having different opinions, there is a textbook definition of what a recession is, and that's two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP. So that's a real meaning inflation adjusted. And that may be the case. Uh, and, and But there's a, an interesting thing to be aware of. The government, they use a very different yardstick. It's a, an organization called the National Bureau of Economic Research, you may know it, it's an independent organization, uh, ENBER for short, has become the official arbiter of recessions. Founded in 1920, rather, ENBER is a private nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, dedicated to conducting economic research. The Enver dis- defines a recession as a significant decline in activity spread across the economy lasting more than a few months. It, dra- it dives deeply into the data tied to industrial production, employment, real income, and wholesale retail sales. During a recession, everyone around this table will know that a country's overall economic output declines. The economy struggles, companies make fewer sales, and people lose work. Matt, I I give that background as we get ourselves ready and positioned for this conversation, because I know even though you've come back refreshed and a lot of great things are happening in your life, there are a few um, indicators in the economy that people are watching and hearing on the news and media and social media that uh, I want to tackle in this call. And I'll lead with this um, as we, we get into our first question for you. David Doyle, North American economist and Canadian market strategist from Macquarie Group, has the following to say. He says, our baseline is for a recession ahead in 2023. We put the odds at approximately 70% is what he says. We forecast Canada being more severely impacted than other developed countries such as the U.S. And this means we anticipate Canada to have a larger contraction in real GDP and more substantial rise in the unemployment rate. He finishes his quote by saying, underpinning this dynamic are the severe structural imbalances in Canada. He points to an extreme level of household debt and residential investment that is more than three standard deviations stretched as a share of GDP. And together with an absence of growth drivers other than housing is what he says, this makes Canada's economy more vulnerable to a recession with consequences likely to be more severe here than elsewhere. Now, Matt, FSI is very well positioned uh, with a boots on the ground perspective on household debt and residential refinancing. How does your boots on the ground perspective at FSI, how is it similar or different from David Doyle's economist perspective? Uh, I think actually it's it's probably well in line. We've talked about this for the last few months. Uh, in our opinion, again, this is just our opinion and everyone's got one. Um, we feel a, a Canadian and global recession is coming as well. Uh, okay. All the signs are to it. So we're, we're on 100% agreement uh, on that today. Tomorrow it may change, but today we feel that that's the way things work as well. Um, in order for, I mean, and obviously the company being around 18 years, we've gone through one or two of these already too. Um the one thing that we've looked at and we've come to a conclusion here and, and, and it's twofold is one for our day-to-day business. Um, 
our applications, our business has not declined at all. We actually had a, uh, June was a record sales month for us. Um, and so this type of environment um, is actually probably pretty suited, uh, pretty well suited for a company like ours. Because as I said, even from COVID, you've seen a lot of job loss. Uh, for people and uh, some people just unable to go back to work. So we've seen people struggle for the last couple of years, build up debt loads uh, and been able to use the equity in their home to get themselves out of it uh, in a lot of cases. Now with what we also expected and we had this talk uh, on our last call is house pricing softening. Um which it has. You've obviously, I don't think it's it's news to anybody. The the housing prices have come down uh, a bit. Uh, the bigger, more valuable homes uh, have been hit harder. More of your cookie cutter, which these days in the GTA is about a million bucks. They haven't been hit as hard. Um, that's pretty uh, standard across the board. The prices haven't moved too much. Um, but if the bigger ticket home is million five, two million, and so forth, uh, have taken uh, a, a bit of a hit here for sure. This, the the thing that I guess is pro and cons for for our business now is we're aware of this. Um, so we've already about two three weeks ago we've scaled back. Uh, so our portfolio right now, so everyone knows, is sitting at just over fifty seven percent loan to value, um, which I believe is is very a very solid number. Um, we're no longer doing any business in the fund in the GTA that has 70% or higher loan to value. Those we are outsourcing, uh, elsewhere to higher risk, uh, people. Um, obviously our first priority is our investors and protecting their investments and assets. Um, I'm assuming other people on this call obviously have money in the stock market, which everybody knows pretty much since the beginning of this year has not gone well. Um, hopefully um, people on this call have, uh, uh, have weathered a bit of the storm here and haven't had some significant losses that we've heard from others. Um, th the pro, I guess, of that is we're more called like, so now GTA under 70 LTV outside of the GTA, it's 60 or under. Uh, and then remote areas, as it's always been, still remains sub 50%. So we're making sure that the business we do do and we do right um, is safe, uh, always putting our investors first. The Obviously, I think most people know a couple of days ago, the Bank of Canada, not only did they raise the overnight rate, they raised it by one full percent, uh, which is something that hasn't happened since 1998. Uh, I didn't even realize it had ever happened in my lifetime that it had gone up that much in one day. Uh, but it has. Um, that's a significant increase um, for anybody that's got a variable rate mortgage. Uh, talking to a few people in the last few days, their mortgage payment uh, in some instances have gone up $1,000 a month because of this, which is obviously going to put a bigger strain uh, on the average Canadian family. Um, with that being said, with where that helps us, is because a five-year fix from the A banks is now over 5% and a fixed mortgage with the B banks is now approaching 7%. What's that now allowed us to do uh, is increase our rates, which is something we haven't done in a very long time. Uh, when rates went the other way and you're down at a point, a point and a half or a 2% range, we still did our first mortgages at 8% pretty much across the board, and our seconds remained at 995, 1095. Um, we've already hit the button starting last month. Of the majority of our second mortgages now are at 1095, and we're even putting some in at 1195 if we can. Um, the thing that that reaps the benefit for the investors is the fund yield is obviously going to increase over the next. Uh, three to six months, probably by at least a half a point if this continues. And the good news is that is, is obviously our target rate of return for our fund is 10%. However, at the end of the year, if we well exceed uh, that number, which we have since inception, um, that gets bonus paid out to the investors. We don't we don't benefit from that as, as the ownership group. That's, uh, that's a benefit uh, to our investors. So we are expecting a recession. There's obviously lots of signs of it already. 
Um, we're bracing for a little bit of a softer housing market. Uh, we've altered the business that we are doing in-house still. And again, anything seven year over in the GTA alone, we're outsourcing to our higher um, risk uh, lenders that are still doing stuff up to 80, 85. Those deals are now going there automatically. Where before we would still do 73, 74, we're not even doing those now uh, in the fund. Um, so we're, we're embracing it. We've already adapted. Uh, we've made changes to our business model because of the environment. And, and if the, the housing market softens even a little bit more here in the next month or two, uh, we'll continue to make adjustments. Thanks, Mel. I appreciate what you shared in terms of a full, um, a full 360 in your response. One of the key areas I'll start to just tackle in some of the data that you shared and now is likely a good time to shift the gears uh, into this segment of the conversation. Let's talk a bit more uh, detail about the, the metrics and you touched on the LTVs inside the GTA and outside the GTA. You talked about um, being able to raise reach, which have an impact on the, um, on the yield numbers. In terms of a year-to-date yield, I'm not sure if you've done your Q2 assessment just yet, but uh, what's the approximate range of year-to-date yield numbers looking at? Again, just once again, just uh, an idea is what we're looking for, the range. Yeah, where the, the last look I had, and again, this accounts for um, the, the, the nav that we do get from Datacore, whom you all get your, your invoices from, they measured on two things, the actual yields of the deals we put in, plus any money sitting and interest that still has to be paid out, even if we don't have money out the door, uh, et cetera. Um, right now, our overall yield is at 10.11. Um, but a lot of deals we did last month, um, which aren't accounted for yet, were done at 10.95. And again, we had a record month last month. So um, it's at 10.11 now. I fully suspect suspect that'll be probably 1016, 1017 um, uh, once our, our new data reporting uh, is out because uh, they calculate that on there. And the loan to value I can speak to because our, our system generates that live. So I know it's at, I think it's 57, it's 57 and change. Um, I don't know the exact uh, rounding percentages, but that I know what it is because that's always live because no matter what it is, when a deal funds, where a deal gets discharged, it's updated automatically. So that number uh, is always accurate. Um, so uh, yeah, we were we are going to start to see an uptake um, in, in what we're doing. Um, again, we didn't even really like it getting down to where it's done, but we wanted to be still be competitive. Um, and another reason why it actually has gone down a bit as well, which I should uh, say is our CIBC business um, has grown leaps and bounds. We funded more deals with CIBC this year at the end of June, so midway through the year, than we have in any other full year so far with our relationship with them being um, four plus years old. So the yield did dip a bit due to the fact that there was a huge influx of CIBC business um, that we've strategically obviously gone after and, and ramped up. Um, but even with them now too is we, I had a nat actually <laughs> while I was away on the beach, I actually had to do a, a national call with the CIBC, uh, the manager, and all the reps across the country, um, and that was one of the big topics. Uh, even before this rate hike, is the expectation that rates were going to start to climb uh, up, and obviously that has happened, and the rates have um, this week with the bank have been adjusted uh, as well. So the yield this year did dip a little bit due to the uh, it, uh, massive increase in business that we've received from CIBC, because um, obviously the collection business, uh, we do get higher yields there regardless. But now with the mix of, we're going to probably see a lot more collection business going in the, the loop the second half of the season, along with CIBC as well. But the rates will be up not only with the, the collection business we do, um, but they'll also be up on the bank side. That's exciting. And also talk, you talk a lot about the current uh, LTV, which is what we take a look at as a, a risk measure at 57% for the portfolio as per your last check. 
That is, um, that's an, an incredible risk adjusted yield to get a double digit return at a 57% uh, LTV, especially in uh, an environment like this as rates continue to increase. I'll shift uh, a little uh, now, going back uh, to where we started with uh, you know a few jabs uh, at our economist friends. There's a, a George Bernard Shaw quote that goes, if all economists in the world were laid end to end, they'd never, even at that point, never reach a conclusion. Uh, Stephen Brown, senior can, uh, Canada economist of capital economics, economics, for example, he actually has a different take to our friend David Doyle, who talked, uh, who put the odds of a, a recession ahead at 70%. Um, Stephen Brown uh, at Capital Economics says, the possibility of a recession in the next 12 months is about 25%, so significantly less than the other fellow. Uh, that said, he says, we should also acknowledge that the Canadian economy is enjoying a, a sizable tailwind from higher commodity prices, which should support GDP growth in the next few quarters. So once again, economists, they have their different schools of thought, they have their different styles uh, of economists and different perspectives with their own nuances. So here we're having a different view from this uh, Stephen Brown fellow. Um, he goes on to say the extent to how deep the recession could be will depend on how much, here's the key, how much house prices fall. He says that the 20% drop in house prices that were that they forecasted over the next 18 months, it looks sizable, but it still would leave prices 20% higher than before the pandemic. And in that scenario, he thinks that any recession would be relatively moderate in the context of the pandemic or the recession that followed the global financial crisis, which you and I and everyone on this call knows very well back in 2008, 2009. Um, all of the high debt load of the debt sector means that there's there are meaningful downside risks. Where I want to go with that, uh, that quote, Matt, is for you to comment. I'd love to hear your comment on what you assess. Once again, it's not about... Um, it's not about having a, a, a specific uh, on to the decimal uh, uh, accuracy response, but I'm looking for nuances, your thinking, your strategic outlook. Can you comment on what you, your sentiment is of what a 20% drop in house prices would mean for the FSI portfolio? I know you've addressed the, the LTV, the within GTA, outside GTA, but if we continue to see further drops, let's say of approximately 20%, what is your sentiment of what that would mean for the FSI portfolio? Yeah, and yeah, no, and, and you know what? And that, I think that's the beauty of our business. So if you take a bank in the last, uh, one of the big banks, one of the big five, or even the credit unions, and et cetera, they, when they did assessments on values of homes in the last um, three, four months, when we obviously had record highs and people were leveraging, getting stuff, 75, 80% down, and now you're seeing a, a, a dip in the values. And these economists are saying that they're expecting a 20% dip in the next 18 months. Well, if you sort of map that out on a, on a calendar of, okay, well, how much per month uh, is that? Well, it's about a 1% drop per month on average. Obviously, there's going to be some more than others. Um, but the beauty of our business is all of our deals are one-year terms. So all of the deals that we did two, three months ago, yeah, were the values higher? Sure they were, but we don't go to 80% loan to value. So the deals that we're doing now, obviously the prices have fallen a little bit. Um, those appraisals we get are current value. So over the course of 12 months, for the most part, our entire portfolio will roll over new. So even as, or even if house prices do drop gradually over the next year and a half to two years the the our whole portfolio in two years will be completely different than what it is today and if the prices do drop as they say they do and we expect them to drop a little bit because we've seen it already we will roll that portfolio over so our old stuff comes off the books our new stuff goes on and our new stuff is at current value and being positioned at a 57 percent loan to value even if there was a 20% dip over the next 18, 24 months, we're positioned well that if we have our business in place and doing what we know we need to do and that cut back on the loan to value because of the uncertainty, and even if our 57 turns into 62 to 65 over the next 12 months, we're still very well positioned at current market values, even with a dip in the overall market where 
you think about a big bank, if they just did a deal now, they're locked in for five years. And if they did something at ADL TV and they're locked in for five years, well, theoretically, when you think about it in the next two years, that that house that they did at ADL TV two years ago, now that house is basically worth 20% less than what it is today, which means that bank is at basically a hundred percent loan to value. That's something I think that's some of the problem that you're going to see with some of the big banks is if there is a slide like that, Banks aren't dumb. They don't want to have a big part of their portfolio at 90 to 100% loan to value that at one time was a regular conventional mortgage. That's not good business for the banks. So in my opinion, the government's going to have to do something there to make sure that something like that doesn't happen because obviously we've seen what happens in the States when that happens. And I think you will see a softening of the interest rates uh, uh, once the inflation, I think, gets stabilized here a bit because... If that happens, you're going to see a lot of defaults uh, with the Canadian big Canadian banks, which is something we haven't seen, but is something that we all have seen happen go on down in the States. Yeah, I think you're bang on with that statement. It's some of the data that we're seeing um, in our world as well. Uh, with that specific statement you made about interest rates having to soften, you, you must know this name, Ray Dalio. He's the CEO chairman of uh, uh, Bridgewater, one of the largest uh, hedge fund managers on the planet. Uh, he's suggesting that central banks will actually have to cut rates uh, by 2024 because of the negative impact it's having um, with, uh, with the largest parts of the population, uh, once they get, in, once it gets inflation under control. So it, it, it's looking like it will come back down again. And that's an interesting point for the business. So a few things that I assess, as you're saying, it's like, you know, at a hundred percent LTV for the banks with the 20% contraction in values, um, at some point, uh, banks are going to want to have to roll these roll these uh, types of uh, mortgages off their books in some way, or find another way to treat them. And that could actually mean business opportunity for, you know, organizations like FSI, because you know, we have conversations with a number of different mixed structures across the country. Um, and uh, we've been at strategic uh, level discussions about well, the banks. This is not their policy to hold these types of, uh, uh, you know, excessively high LTB uh, mortgages on their portfolio, especially if they're not insured. And that's the other thing. You can't go back and retroactively insure them once you underwrite them and they're within a term, right? If you have a five-year locked-in term. So there's some yeah. there's some concern about risk management, uh, even, you know, folks who are on the Bay Street and Wall Street side, some of our friends that we talk to, they know that's coming. They're already preparing for it in some ways. So, uh, that spells opportunity for you, and you know, I'm sure your leadership is talking about how to take advantage of that at some point. I want to roll to a uh, next question I have here. Um, uh, on June 28th, 2022, the, the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions uh, released an advisory uh, that they entitled Clarification on the Treatment of Innovative Real Estate Secured Lending Products under Guideline B20. Um, the advisory uh, complements existing expectations, uh, which articulates OSFI's expectations regarding underwriting practices and procedures for reverse residential mortgages, residential mortgages, and uh, mortgages with shared equity features and combined loan plans. Uh, you may have, you know this name, no, probably, definitely not from your world. Combined loan plans are typically tradi a traditional uh, amortizing mortgage loan blended with a revolving line of credit. Um, as of March 2022, uh, combined loan plans, or CLPs, that are above 65% LTV account for about $204 billion of the $1.8 trillion in total outstanding residential mortgages per the Bank of Canada data. Yeah. Now, the question I have for you here, since we're seeing opportunity in different areas of increasing uh, with the current environment, as FSI continues to grow, Matt, what new financing solutions, if any, are you considering? Um, I, I, at this point, and yeah, we are aware that, that that report did come out the other day um, where people um, are able to more easily access um, financing from the primary bank up to 65 LTV, uh, regardless of, of TDS, GDS. Um, what that, with the current environment, I don't know what that exactly may or, or may look like to, to some of these banks now, because again, 
depending on what value they want to use and when. Um, Because historically what banks do is they do, they take values at the time the mortgage and or a line of credit uh, was done, um, not taking into account current values. And obviously historically, as we all know, house pricing has has always increased over time. Yeah, a few dips here and there, but it goes up. So we haven't really looked at down the road, what does that look like for us if, uh, or sorry, not if, when this this does take place and w- how do we need to adjust to it? Um, our big part of our business, and even with CIBC, it's the collection side. So if there's clients that are struggling and have the two $300 or two $300 uh, credit score numbers, they're not getting approved for an additional line of credit. Um, they're not getting approved for an additional mortgage. They're not getting approved for additional anything financing. And, and this is the strategic partnership that we have with CIBC is that we're here that they don't lose this client. So yeah, they've got racked up CIBC debt, sometimes lines of credit, credit card debt, obviously whatever else, cars, taxes, et cetera. We clean all that up for their clients. Um, so we're a one year retention span and, and on the collection side, it's the same thing. These people all have first mortgages somewhere. Um, and they're with either an A or, or a B bank cause we can't go behind private. So all of the deals we are doing is there is an A or B bank primary lending, uh, always in front of us. Um, so when a client's no longer eligible because of either income and or credit or both, um, they have to come to us to get that cleaned up and rehabilitated. So whether it's our collection channel directly and or our bank channel, both types of businesses that we do essentially are the same type of business. Obviously the bank business is a little bit cleaner. People aren't as far gone if we're still dealing with the bank. Once they get to the collection realm, um, it's pretty much they've written off, if not everything, almost everything. And most of the time, obviously it is everything. So it's, our business model long term, I don't think is going to be is going to need to change because we're not we don't do near prime business. That's not the business we're in. And, and as I tell CIBC when I had the national call and they have obviously they have new reps that come and go and stuff like that. And I always tell them, I'm not your first phone call. I'm not your second phone call. I'm probably not even your third phone call. I'm the guy that I am here when your client's credit score is gone, your client says income, there's been health issues, maybe a marital breakdown, and it's doom and gloom, but there's equity in their property, that's when you call me. When I cave, my TDS, GDS is too high, my credit score is too low, I, how am I going to help these people? That's when you give me a call and they've got equity. Don't come to me at 80% LTV and to bail somebody out that has that's not even working and their credit score is 250 that's not the business we're in. Um, so it's, as I said, this, this change, I guess, that the government uh, and the banks are going to be putting in place, it's to help the bank clients uh, that are still bankable clients that are going to benefit um, from, this, from this scenario. Those aren't our clients. They never have been. They never will be. We're, that, that's not the clientele that we go after. Uh, for our business. So it's, it's not going to really, I don't think in the long term change what we do or how we do it, because if those clients were able to get financing from the bank up to 65, that's where we live too. We're never going to see those clients anyways, because if they're bankable, they're going to get bailed out by the, by the banks on the A side. We get the ones that are past the bankable, um, which is what our wheelhouse is. And that business that, that we do, uh, I don't see this impacting that uh, very much, if not at all. Yeah, thanks for that uh, perspective. Uh, I'd like to open up the the call to the folks that are on the line. And if you'd like to use the chat feature, which is that um, speech bubble icon, to type your questions, comments, or feedback uh, to Matt as I moderate the call, I'd be happy to uh, share those back with him. Please feel free to use the chat button to add your questions, thoughts, or feedback. Um, Matt, as we look to wrap up the call, uh, I'd like to to highlight really the the benefit. I mean, when most folks uh, are invested, um, they generally are you know core invested in the equity markets and that's it. But at Pangeo, we recognize to preserve capital and to grow wealth over the long term, a healthy, perspective on diversification really helps to 
uh, sustain wealth and growth over time. And that's why FSI as a partner really is, um, is, is at the table with our clients because you actually have um, an inverse performance compared to the equity markets. Uh, so negative correlation is what we would use in the investment uh, uh, language. Earlier this year, um, you've been talking about CIBC, but earlier this year, C CIBC Deputy Chief Economist and Managing Director Benjamin Tal, a name I know you're familiar with, he says this, he says, the enemy is not higher interest rate. Your enemy is rapidly rising interest rates. Um, now, you alluded to yesterday, the Bank of Canada dramatically increased rates by 1%, the biggest single rate jump in over 20 years. And while dramatic, the real risk isn't the size, but the speed of the increase. Benjamin Tell says that he would prefer to see a short, sharp hike, followed by a pause to assess its impacts, because they want to see if the increase of this magnitude would really likely be enough to rein in inflation and stabilize the economy which from a logical perspective uh, may have some merit. Uh, he also says that rising interest rates create an opportunity for alternative lenders like FSI to enter the market and continue to grow. Um, and this is of course a phenomenon that's frequently the concern of regulators. Benjamin Tal says, I expect the share of mix and private lending to rise over the next two years. And this is according to a statistics a Canada survey of non-bank mortgage lenders, where non-bank lenders, other than credit unions, held over um, $115 billion worth of residential mortgages in the third quarter of last year, and that was expected to increase significantly in 2022. Now, Matt, based on this perspective, it appears to me uh, by this assessment the FSI business model is really poised for significant success over the 20, coming 24 months. I'm going to roll the microphone back to you for final thoughts or commentary uh, on this call about those um, perspectives from Benjamin Tal and the coming future success for private lenders over the next 18 to 24 months. Um, yeah, you know what? And, 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 I, and I assessed that earlier. I 100% agree there. Like, our, our business in the last quarter has thrived with the number of deals we're getting in, the number of deals we're funding, the number of deals we're doing. Not only are we doing record numbers, but we're also doing it with our lowest loan to value that our fund has ever had. We've generally dabbled in around the, the 62, 63 range, which is generally where we normally sit, but to have dropped at even another 5%, um, obviously, it takes a lot to move a needle uh, on a portfolio like that that far down. But the fact that we've done that um, is is quite significant. And 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 he's right. Uh, companies like ours, especially with the the higher rates, like let, and as I said earlier, uh, people that have been on variable rate mortgages that took a twenty five or thirty year amortization and just took whatever that regular payment, not above and beyond. In the last six months, like, and I'll speak to myself, my, my variable rate mortgage went from 145, and as of right now, it's sitting at 3.7. That's a significant increase. Uh, again, if you have a credit card with 500 bucks on it, uh, a, point, a couple of points isn't going to make a, a big difference. But when you're talking, I don't know what the average mortgage size in Canada is right now, but I'm assuming it's probably five, six hundred thousand. And and talking to a few people, even in our office of what their payments have increased from. Like I had one person that their payment a couple of, uh, a few months ago went from 1500 and when they looked at their banking today, it's over $2,200. And these are, as I said, most Canadians, unfortunately, live paycheck to paycheck. Um, so an increase like that, that's, that's already, uh, that's being compounded with, they're paying more for gas than they were, 12 months ago, they're paying a lot more for groceries than they were 12 months ago. They're paying a lot more for everything than they were 12 months ago. And then on top of that, you're going to uh, have a huge increase in your mortgage payment, which is there's no financial, obviously, benefit to anybody. If you're having to pay more towards your mortgage, that doesn't put more food on your table or, or get you entertainment or, or do put more clothes on your, your family. It's a cost that just comes right out of your pocket. And if you live paycheck to paycheck, which is most Canadians, and you get heavily impacted like this, something's got to give. And, and a lot of Canadians have learned in the last couple of years is they've cut a lot of stuff out of their lives in order to survive 
well, this now taking another 700, and I said that might be on the low scale, I'm not sure. You start taking this kind of money out of people's, and this is take home money too on a monthly basis. What are people going to start to have to do to rely on in order to keep surviving, to keep their head above water? They're going to have to use credit cards. They're going to have to use lines of credit. They're going to get racked up. Um, and we've seen this in the last recession, again, where our company thrived because of this. So I think he's very right in the next two years, companies like ours will thrive because people, they just, a lot of people are still in debt from the last two years. And I think you're going to see that continue to compound where some people may have escaped that part of it. I don't know if they're going to escape this one with the gas, the food, um, increased mortgage payments, et cetera. Everything's gone up. And the fallout usually is they got to come to for secondary financing to bail them out short term. And that's where companies like ours uh, obviously come in and thrive. The nice thing is, as I said, we're not here to take someone's home. We're not, we're hopefully in 12 months putting them in a better financial position than they are today. Um, obviously prepaid mortgages, which we, we really ramped up a few years ago and have continued to do so that has helped keep our portfolio healthy and safe because we have all these clients, 12 month payments up front. Um, so this is something that we've, um, again, back in the day realized, well, if we have all their payments up front, they can't default because we already, and we've cleaned up all their debt. They should be good for the next 12 months. They, their, their credit's all cleaned up. They're, they have no payments with us. We've already got their payments. They only have to make their first mortgage payment and, and property taxes. That alleviates stuff for people. But now with these increases likely in mortgage payments, unless you went fixed, um, it's going to have an impact on, on a lot of people in this country. There's no question. Yeah, indeed. And uh, I think you've painted a very um, sober picture, a sobering rather picture of uh, what's uh, what is coming and what's been happening uh, and what the government of Canada to some degree is very clearly aware of in terms of the elevated debt levels and the even the cash flow, the, the monthly fiscal constraints for Canadians. You know, what's interesting as we think about this uh, from an, an economist perspective or even just a common sense perspective, as your mortgage in payment increases, you've got less disposable income, uh, even considering the other things you mentioned, increasing gas prices and food. And one of the things that generally gets impacted first, as we know the model, because it's really human behavior, which is to some degree predictable, is that a drop in discretionary spending occurs in those really challenging times. So the you know big family vacations that once happen won't happen for the next year or two or so, which is an interesting thing to consider in the context of a recession. Because if consumers don't have money to spend and they're going to go on credit, like you're saying, in a period of slowing economic uh, slowing economic environment, we are really in a, in a um, precarious position to navigate. And this is how complex what the bank, the central bank uh, or Bank of Canada has to do really to to help us navigate through this next um, uh, six to 12 months in a way that really will will determine how the next three or four years will go for most Canadians. So, um, you know, to Benjamin Tal's point about the, you know, taking the shot in the arm, with the big increase very quickly, if this doesn't work, then, you know, we may have to seek other measures. But to your point, I want to conclude on that note of business where the FSI business model really is positioned to, um, to benefit from the, the coming environment. And your particular underlying asset has very low correlation to the equity market. So as we balance our client portfolios uh, at Pangea, we're grateful to have you and your team and your expertise as a partner at our table. Matt, thank you so very much. Uh, any final thoughts or comments that you'd like to make? Uh, I know I've given you the mic before, but uh, as we look to lock off, we're just approaching 8.15. And any final sentiments before we leave the call? Over to you, Matt. No, I, I said I think we've covered a lot of uh, very important key points uh, in this call, and I appreciated that. And, and as always, tell uh, everybody in this call, uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me directly after this call and have any questions, qualms, you can call me, shoot me an email, um, even a three-way with Declan, uh, if that makes put your 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 mind at ease. Because I, it, it, on top of obviously our, our our company doing well, obviously with a stock market in, in uh, complete turmoil, and and a lot of people say it's going to go down even further. We're obviously getting a huge influx in in new um, investor money, 
um, which obviously we can never have enough of it. <laughs> um, so that's great. Uh, we're happy to have it. Um, but as I said, I think that the business model we have and the type of business we do, um, I think has been a very um, positive uh, investment for everybody. Um, again, we're not flashy where you're going to get a, a 20, 25% rate of your return on your money. Um, but like the stock market this year, we're also not going to lose 15 to 20%, uh, which I think is on average what the people have, uh, in the stock market have done is you get your 10% compounding, you're, you're about 10 and a half. Uh, and it's a consistent lineup. Uh, over time and you know what it's something that uh, I hope everyone feels that their investment that they can sleep at night with and not have to worry about it that it's almost like clockwork every month I get my statement and I had more than I had last month and and uh, and we fully expect that to continue going forward. Yeah thanks very much Matt really appreciate you joining us uh, on Pentius 2022 Q2 investment manager update look forward to touching base with you again in Q3 have a great evening and uh, once again thank you for sharing time uh, with us this evening. Not a problem. Pleasure as always. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye now. Bye, everyone. Bye now.